Hey everyone, back again today now. I'm covering the second publication I ever wrote, which is called Baudrillard's Binaries, um, colon, A Politics of Antagonism, which I wrote in 2019, I believe, uh, for a journal called Interstudia. Uh, and it, it was an effort for me to think through some problems in Baudrillard's work, notably some contradictions and some difficulties when actually trying to engage with it, trying to understand it. And so this was my attempt to try to unravel those, to try to make them clear, at least to me. Now, if you're new here, welcome, I'm David. I try to explain philosophical concepts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, you'll go and see videos that I have up here. There's like 250 of them. I try to release videos every single week, sometimes twice a week. If you want to help me out, like, share, subscribe, like I've already said. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And um, if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form if you're into that. Or if you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video for this on YouTube if you're interested in that at all. So I'm going to include a link for this so you can go and find it if you want. You, I think you'll be able to find this online. If not, I, I, I'm Matt. I, I bet many of you are affiliated with the university. You can order it through your university library for free, uh, but I think it's I think it's accessible online. But this is how it goes. So in 1998, near the midnight of Jean Baudrillard's philosophical career, Antoine van der Bremuschke, which I think is how this is pronounced, asked him how he, a self-proclaimed radical thinker, could rely on the binary logic of dialectics. To this charge, Baudrillard replied by way of a distinction, a distinction between the binary logic he was accused of administering and the principles of challenge, of antagonism. Baudrillard locates himself in the domain of the latter, proclaiming that what we are concerned with is a change of the rules. A game doesn't necessarily involve two opposed hostile terms. You have the game, you have the rules, and you have the opponents. There is thus a preservation of a binary mode of organization, but a binary without hierarchy, where neither side is privileged over the other. To accentuate this point, Baudrillard considers his dynamic in the subject-object relationship, where he suggests that the object is not an alternative to the subject. The subject is not the opposite of the object, in the sense that the only choice left would be that between the hegemony of the subject and the hegemony of the object. Rather, these two poles exist in perpetual antagonism, where one never wins out over the other. This distinction portends Baudrillard's entire theoretical oeuvre, all his corpus, all his work. However, the role that binaries or antagonisms play in Baudrillard's work has remained under theorized. There may be numerous reasons for this general disavowal, but I wish to extrapolate on one briefly, notably that Baudrillard is often considered a thinker of total systems, an apocalyptic thinker that warns against the oppressive advent of simulacrum. This essay pays credence to these popular expeditions into Baudrillard's work, by conducting its own excursion into the understudied role that antagonism plays for him and what happens to it under the logic of the simulacrum and integral reality, two concepts of endless import to Baudrillard's radical imagination. Now, traditionally, the way that the simulacrum is conceived is, is in terms of its antithetical position to reality. This is how it's often approached or understood. For example, Mark uh, Oliver de Pasco argues that the exponential decay in the concurrent metastatic transmutation of the objective, the real and the rational into simulacra, is arguably one of the most thought-provoking facts of contemporary history. So while certainly interesting and of great relevance to the contemporary developments of artificial intelligence, algorithmic software, and, and so on, Pasco's approach makes a fundamental error when considering Baudrillard's theorization of the advent of the simulacrum. Baudrillard does not decry the simulacrum for replacing reality. He is rather concerned with how reality comes into being under the simulacrum. To suggest otherwise is to commit oneself to an arch-classical Platonism and to a naive nostalgia for what Baudrillard would call second-order simulacra, or even first-order simulacra. The problem of the simulacrum is put by Baudrillard as follows. In his words, it is a, a gigantic enterprise of disillusionment, of literally putting the illusion of the world to death to leave an absolutely real world in its stead. This is what is properly meant by simulation. Reality is not a privileged age that teleologically precedes 
precedes simulation, it is in fact a particular case of that simulation. So what is at risk of transpiring under the simulacrum is not then, as thinkers like Pasco suggest, the exponential decay and the concurrent metastatic transmutation of the objective. It is instead the profusion of precisely what he believes to be at risk of disappearing, that is, reality, a profusion of reality. The advent of hyperreality, or the more real than real, reaches its apotheosis, its peak, in Baudrillard's work with the advent of what he calls integral reality. This is a concept that Baudrillard develops most rigorously in his last published book, The Intelligence of Evil or the Lucidity Pact. It is with this text, among others, that Baudrillard sketches what, he, what the stakes are for the advent of the simulacrum or hyperreality. Integral reality is the stage of the simulacrum where everything operates in an integrated circuit in the information media in our heads too. The image feedback dominates the insistent presence of the monitors, this convolution of things that operate in a loop, that connect back round to themselves. This tautogorical formulation forecloses the possibility of for radical alterity, presenting an endless proliferation of the same. This logic subtends concerns that Baudrillard sketches in his writings on both the Iraq and Gulf Wars, where there is an exercise of a neo-imperialistic Western military expansion that threatens to, in his words, subject the many different cultures to the unforgiving law of equivalence. The law of equivalence is the law that sees everything exchangeable under the spectral light of the commodity form made famous by uh, America, at least that kind of commodity form. No, uh, no more difference, no more alterity, only the same under the globalized tyranny of the Western military and cultural industries. The extinction of the original reference alone facilitates the general law of equivalences, Baudrillard writes. And here we may hear the echoes of the position put forward by Pasco that there is a loss of an original, a loss of a reality. However, I propose that the opposite is the case, that we may understand as the original reference and the necessary condition to conjure away the advent of the law of equivalence, this should not be understood as a stagnant, concretized, and universal entity, universal phenomenon. The original reference that he is referring to here, that is lost, is instead a reference shrouded in indeterminacy, one that sprouts from the antagonistic interplay between at least two intense poles. This original reference is then a synergistical entity that derives from the friction produced between these two or more poles, and that eludes identification, it eludes being pinned down. So in Baudrillard's words, we are no longer conscious of the spiral of simulation that preceded reality. In truth, our unconscious is found here, in our incomprehension before the vertiginous indetermination and simulation that rules the sacred disorder of our lives. This is the role of seduction for Baudrillard, to structure by way of an indeterminate anti-structure the possibilities within the simulation that precedes reality to make the possible itself uh, no longer possible. It is with the text seduction that Baudrillard clearly demarcates his conceptual turn from dialectics as a teleologically positive or negative, if we heed the words of Adorno, movement to instead propose that the world, people, and cultures are guided by what he calls seduction as destiny. Seduction is a residual element of a magical, fateful world, a risky, vertiginous, and predestined world. It is what is quietly effective in a visibly efficient and stolid world. The world of the magical, a reductive descriptor, no doubt, was a world of antagonistic str struggle, or agonistic struggle, and it was by virtue of this struggle that possibility was itself possible. The rule of seduction opposes the law of dialectics and has its own principles for progression. In Baudrillard's words, magic, however, is something very different. It is a ritual for the maintenance of the world as a play of analogical relations, a cyclical progression where everything is linked together by their signs. An immense game, rule governs magic, and the basic problem is to ensure, by means of ritual, that everything continues to play thus, by analogical contiguity and creeping seduction. It has nothing to do with linear relations of cause and effect. The latter, our way of understanding the world is objective but unsettled. Baudrillard's characterization of this age of magic is intended, in some sense, 
to sketch an ontological condition of all people, cultures, gods, and other non-human beings. However, as I su suggested above, Baudrillard deliberately keeps this sketch vague in order to maintain an enigmatic duel, one that the seduction solves, but without disclosing the secret. This is because the constitutive elements that meet in the binary encounter are never determined in advance. Rather, there is a minimum reversibility which puts an end to every fixed opposition and therefore every conventional semiology. One such instance is that of the subject seducing the object and, to be sure, the reverse. Baudrillard illustrates this, I believe, the most eloquently when he considers the playful exchange between a psychologist and a rat. I believe this was in Fatal Strategies where the rat tells about how he ended up by perfectly conditioning the psychologist to give him a piece of bread every time he lifted the gate of his cage. So to imagine the subject-object relationship in this way is to remain faithful to their respective differences while refusing to hierarchize their positions, such as the principle of radical alterity or the principle of singularity, that which marks an absolute difference, a radical difference, something more different than difference, at the farthest possible remove from this confusion of the world with its double. Seduction bridges the chasm between any disparate poles, not so that they may dissolve into a homogeneous mass, but so that their proximity to one another can force them to change and develop to meet the challenge posed by the other. For, in Baudrillard's words, nothing exists naturally. Things exist because challenged and because summoned to respond to that challenge. This is the logic that guides all movement. And this logic is precisely that, that which is uh, under assault by the advent of the simulacrum, not of reality. So the simulacrum is not so clearly defined in its objective, however. This is because Baudrillard maintains that there are to be at least two possible manifestations of the simulacrum that both, remaining faithful to the principles of seduction, possess and challenge the other. In seduction, he suggests that the simulacrum belongs either to the domain of enchanted simulation, or the domain of disenchanted simulation. In this taxonomic breakdown, the former represents the trompe l'oeil, falser than far, false, the secret of appearances, while the latter, pornography, for example, marks the truer than true, the height of the simulacrum. The simulacrum is thus not an antagonistic struggle with reality. It has always been on the scene, complicit with reality, and is part of the world and people as their ontological condition, conditions. The conflict is between the realm of enchanted simulation and that of disenchanted simulation. Disenchanted simulation possesses unfailing powers of discrimination, a derivative of the masculine order that flocks to the spectral light of truth. The simulacrum may then assume two different forms, a benevolent or a malevolent form, that are always struggling against one another in a Manichaean way. The conceptual dyad here that these two forms assume can be further dissected to locate the binaries, or lack thereof, found within each side of the binary. This is explicated upon most clearly in Baudrillard's late work, specifically. At this stage, Baudrillard meditates on the statuses of good and evil in the simulacral episteme, positing them there that there is a global effort propagated by the West to make the world transparent and operational by exterminating or extirpating from it any illusion and any evil force. The good may then be understood as the maintenance of a delicate interplay between good and evil for Baudrillard, whereas um, where the chiasmic principle of seduction may persist. Evil, on the other hand, should be understood as the complete absorption of evil by the good. A world without evil is the most evil world for Baudrillard. As he writes, terrorism is still a lesser evil than a police state capable of eradicating it. To collapse and homogenize the ethereal relationship between good and evil would be to purge the world of the principle of seduction and to concomitantly submit the world to a terrorist rationalization, the likes of which the world has never seen. Now, science is at the forefront of this epistemological shift, uh, the model of oppression par excellence, what he calls the legitimating principle of technical operations on the real and on the world the principles of an objective materialism. Now, since science stimulates this transformation of the world from a binary system of antagonism to one of a monochromic, monochromic repression, we, we see a similar thing happen in Nietzsche, where he shared the similar concern when he declared that science is what he called the impoverishment of life. 
science only ever perpetuates itself in its never-ending cycle of tautological satisfaction. That is, uh, it's steadily foreclosing the possibility for difference to creep into its institutional formations. Now, this is because science does not only strive to maintain itself, it also strives to exercise the world of all negativity, contradiction, and opposition to leave the world in a state of scientific euphoria. The apotheosis of asceticism, as Nietzsche described it. However, and this may be the greatest mystery of Baudrillard's work, this collision course with simulacral perfection will never occur. In The Vital Illusion, Baudrillard quotes Heidegger and his concern for the state of technology in the 20th century, where he writes, that is Heidegger, when we look into the ambiguous essence of technology, we behold the constellation, the stellar course of the mystery. Now, Baudrillard contemplates this point, proposing that this sentence is quite enigmatic, since it seems to contradict Heidegger's interpretation of technology as negative ontology, as a loss of being, as a definitive unveiling of the secret of the universe, as a disenchanted inspection, an echazuma of the world, or a gestel of the world. In short, as the perfect crime itself, the alternative would be that, at the extreme horizon of technology, Something else happens, another game. With other rules, the point is that the constellation of the secret still resists, remains alive. The day of reckoning may never arise because the principles of seduction, challenge, and antagonism are eternal for Baudrillard. Moreover, in the case of good and evil, Baudrillard even provides his readers with a term to attach to this catechistic, catechistic revival of what one may assume to have been lost, that is, ventriloquist evil. The unexplainable manifestation of negativity in zones where it is believed to have disappeared. Now, Baudrillard expands upon this point in his consideration of disease and inoculation to argue that in the face of an ever improving system of biological defenses, there are always going to be viruses and diseases that breach those defenses. For him, the purification of bodies occurs once they have been dispossessed of their defenses and are then vulnerable to science and technology. In response to this overcoating by science and technology, various anomalous symptoms develop from the depths of the system itself, countering with reactive violence and virulence the political overcontrol of the social body, the biological overcontrol of the physical body. That's pretty relevant today, I would say. <laughs> Didn't even remember that part. Uh, so there is thus no reason to believe that the system will completely eclipse the symbolic order of a time long gone. Uh, there is a problem with this formulation that presents itself under capitalism specifically, however. Deleuze and Guattari demonstrate this issue in Anti-Oedipus when they write that no one has ever died from contradictions. And the more that capitalism breaks down, the more it schizophrenizes, the better it works, the American way. What Deleuze and Guattari are describing is a system that in a completely oppressive way is capable of containing its negativity to work in its favor. This revelation demands a reevaluation of Baudrillard's optimism concerning the eternality, uh, the etern eternality of seduction to sketch what is at stake. Notably, this pertains to the possibility that the simulacrum may, in proper late capitalist fashion, simulate the form of antagonism once reserved for the challenge and seduction, or for challenges and seduction. Our task is then to discern the real manifestations of antagonism from those harbingers of uh, simulacral totality. Now, Baudrillard first sketches the possibility of an oppressive and artificial antagonism in symbolic exchange and death. Now, that's a claim that I think I'm going out of the essay here. That's a claim thinking back. I think we can get uh, earlier examples of this, so that I don't think that was the first time. Anyways, that's what happens when you aren't fully educated about the thing you're writing about. So Baudrillard first sketches the possibility of an oppressive and artificial antagonism in symbolic exchange and death when he considers the significance of the World Trade Center's two towers. The two towers of the World Trade Center are the visible sign of the closure of a system to the vertigo of doubling. This elevation to the vertiginous plateau of the double is only an illusory transcendence, the false resurrection of a principle of antagonism indicative of an era that precedes integral reality. Now what the World Trade Center's, th their towers reveal for Baudrillard is the possibility of a simulated form of antagonism. There is a distinction there that must be made between antagonism that Baudrillard celebrates and the one that he admonishes. Now unfortunately, Baudrillard did not provide the blueprints for a litmus test that it, can I really identify the difference. 
The task is then, given the vague characterization of an, of an oppressive, oppressive system as being a closed one, the task is to recognize the systems that foreclose the possibility for difference and those that maintain that very possibility. This task is only complicated when we reconsider the words of Tadeusz and Guattari, who correctly identify that capitalism is a system that welcomes difference and renders that difference imminent to its proliferation. We must not only differentiate between the systems that deny and those that accept difference, we must expand upon these two possibilities to observe their possible subcategories that reveal their hidden intent. Now, these categories can be subdivided into four subcategories that paint a more accurate portrait of this phenomenon and that, I believe, resolve the antinomy that systems of difference can be oppressive and systems uh, that foreclose possibility can be benevolent. So here I present the four different formulations and to make it as clear as possible, I'll list them out. So there can be malevolent denial, malevolent acceptance, benevolent denial, and benevolent acceptance. Now, the malevolent ones are ones that I don't like and I don't think Baudrillard likes, ways to conduct the world and people, whereas the benevolent ones are the good ones. So here we can have, we can see forms of malevolent denial of otherness, and then we can see benevolent denials of otherness or we can see benevolent acceptance or malevolent acceptance. So I hope that's clear enough. So we start here with malevolent denial. So some systems that foreclose the possibility for difference can be characterized as autopoietic, their borders blending with the overall landscape that they are found in. And they, by virtue of the disappearance of their borders into the landscape, are guided by their own imminent logic of movement. One example that fits this criterion is the police force that is both ubiquitous and closed. The police are everywhere, yet they cannot be breached. They are the ideal manifestation of the law that Baudrillard describes, which claims to be the discursive sign of a legal instance and hidden truth. It results in repression and prohibitions. Because of their ubiquity, they are able to disappear into the infinitesimal cracks of the societal paradigm in which they are situated. Now I use here a quote from Sarah Ahmed to illustrate this, where she writes that uh, because of their ubiquity, or um, she writes that in terms of their ubiquity, one fits and by fitting, the surfaces of bodies disappear from view. The disappearance of the surface is instructive in feelings of comfort, bodies extend into spaces and spaces extend into bodies. Now the capacity to disappear is reserved for a certain group to be able to blend into that sphere is reserved for a certain group or for certain groups, most notably corresponding to a white, cis, heterosexual male, um, able-bodied and so on. Uh, and those, those who are excluded from this undergo a separate form of disappearance by their being disallowed from or discriminated against with, within that structure. So the automatic return of all forms of racism, integri integrism, and exclusion in reaction to this unconditional conviviality, as Baudrillard writes. So let it be clear here that uh, a properly multicultural model does not necessarily assuage the oppressive propensity of this system, it contains insurgents in ways that render its opposition unthinkable under the auspices of a welcoming state or cultural apparatus. Now this is what leads us into what is, I call, malevolent acceptance. So when a cultural people are appropriated by another, we know we are in the throes of a malevolent model of acceptance. Bell Hooks chronicles this phenomenon eloquently when she writes that when race and ethnicity become commodified as resources for pleasure, the culture of specific groups as well as the bodies of individuals can be seen as constituting an alternative playground where members of dominating races, gender, sexual practices affirm their power over in intimate relations with the other. This mode of cultural appropriation opposes the logic of seduction that lies in non-reconciliation with the other in preserving the alien status of the other. This more closely represents the opposite of seduction, that is provocation, which does not leave you free to be, it calls on you to reveal yourself as you are. It is always blackmailed by identity, and thus a symbolic murder since you are never that, except precisely by being condemned to it, in Baudrillard's words. And for example, you know, um, a very common microaggression that people of color will experience is people asking them, oh, well, where they're from as though their identity dictates uh, who they are and who they can be. And people have to know exactly 
where they come from so that they can properly uh, know how to engage with the person after blocking them off into that identity. Now, what this ultimately culminates into is a disappearance of radical alterity, and it's being packaged and commodified for the colonial authority that appropriates it. Now, in distinction to benevolent denial, where one is dispossessed by the other, malevolent acceptance apodictically renders us dispossessed of the other. The other is then forced into the domain of oppressive simulation where they are galvanized into an oppressive uh, image form forever, the museification of the other. And that puts us here into benevolent denial. So the possibility of a benevolent form of exclusion is difficult to imagine. Indeed, there is little likelihood that any such system is possible in the age of, the glo of global finance capitalism. However, this does not stop Baudrillard from considering the radical potential of the system entirely predicated on its own epistemological paradigm, a system of absolute difference, a radical difference, something more different than difference. This is what is properly understood as singularity, that which reproduces itself as is at every moment and autonomously to reinvent itself. Singularity opposes the totalizing, totalizing logic of integral reality that subjects and homogenizes the world under the augury of a supposedly benevolent scientific and cultural paradigm. It does this by presenting alternatives to a system that believes itself to be superior to all others and by dissuading the planetary expansion of a single set of principles. What is more, these modes of organization, precisely by their being different from others, maintain the antagonism necessary for the realization of the dual form, the agon, which is a symbolic form for the realization of the, uh, is a symbolic form as such, it might be said to be much nearer to seduction and challenge than to violence. This does not preclude the possibility of violent acts, it instead marks a moment when violence is not conducted for its own sake, here we might hear the resonances of Deleuze and Guattari's theorization of the war machine prior to its being appropriated by uh, the state apparatus of capture. So the antagonism present in this formulation may resolve itself through violent means, but that does not mean that violence is the sole avenue by which the antagonism is resolved. Symbolic exchange and the principle of seduction are two other possible routes to assuage the limit point of the antagonism in a nonviolent way. These two alternatives to violent resolution do not threaten to eclipse one side of the antagonistic struggle through force. Instead, the antagonism fostered by these institutions maintains the existence of the other that serves the end of realizing the Hegelian conceptualization of the self-other relationship. Now that puts us into benevolent acceptance. So this possibility ironically mirrors that which is described by benevolent denial. Now, what is characteristically different, however, is the extent to which benevolent acceptance marks an elevation of the logic of denial. Denial, fostered by recognition of difference, reaches its climax when different singular groups are forced into an, an antagonistic struggle. Again, this is not simply a violent struggle, but one housed in the indeterminate logic of symbolic exchange that presents a foray into something wholly new. Evidence of Baudrillard's faith in such an interaction is most clearly articulated, perhaps surprisingly, when he considers the role of art, uh, of the art auction, in demonstrating the potential of, for this antagonistic str struggle. He says, whoever the vanquisher in the challenge, the essential function of the auction is the institution of a community of the privileged, who define themselves as such by agonistic speculation upon a restricted corpus of signs. Ideology is not a mysterious duping of consciousness, it is a social logic that is substituted for another, thus exchanging uh, that, that is thus changing the very definition of value. So what we see in the exchange is the formulation of a concrete community of exchange amongst peers. The relative homogenization that occurs is immediately assuaged by the reification of an autonomous singularity necessary for a place within that framework. One thus draws the, the other into one's area of weakness, which is also his or her area of weakness, welcoming the other to exist as themselves and by virtue of that difference present new opportunities for each party involved. Now, I believe it is safe to suggest that Baudrillard would appreciate the benevolent manifestations of these encounters over the malevolent ones. A Baudrillardian radical theory is in the service of ensuring that the other is not eclipsed in these encounters, subjecting them to the spectral light of a global cultural apparatus. This is a more accurate demonstration of the problem of the simulacrum when we are no longer alienated within a conflictual reality, he writes, uh, and are expelled instead by a definitive non-contradictory reality. The non-contradictory form 
strives to purge the world of all difference and to subject it to the totalizing logic of a single worldview. What Baudrillard concedes resembles a new world order of sorts. This is how a Baudrillardian critique should be conducted, not as a plea for a return to reality as, Bas as Pascal proclaims, but as a desire to maintain that principle of antagonism necessary to conjure away the crystallization of a global order engineered for the benefit of a single group. The oppressive simulacral appears uh, apparatus, the overarching framework of malevolent acceptance and malevolent denial may assume many forms, and I will now take the time to explore two that are very prescient today. The first is the incessant desire by white uh, feminists, because I'm going to talk about feminism here, by white feminists in the global north who, under the guide uh, of a progressive humanitarianism, dictate what constitutes proper behavior for people in other contexts. Now, the second example extends the popular understanding of the simulacrum, its indubitable affinity with contemporary virtual technologies to propose that beneath the veneer of the ostensibly emancipatory potential of most technological developments today, they surreptitiously affirm and intensify a single world order guided by the cultural logic of computation. Now, these contemporary phenomena each, phenomena each, I believe, address the manifestations of the oppressive simulacrum in one way or another signaling the propensity to appropriate reality for the purpose of eradicating differences and otherness. The desire of white feminists, to return to that one, to start with that one, uh, activists to supposedly save women in the global south is by no means a new phenomenon. Indeed, one of the motivations behind the giant process of colonialism uh, that paid credence to the so-called white man's burden was to purportedly civilize those less developed. It was and still is believed that it is the duty of white Europeans to disseminate their knowledge to the rest of the world so that the latter may too enjoy the wonders of the alleged they, they would allegedly derive from European culture. So while the many current strands of feminist activism, even those strands that lean heavily in the neoliberal and white supremacist direction, in no way present a congruent threat leveled by colonialism, they nevertheless present an analogous manifestation of the same cultural logic. Colonial efforts of centuries past find this correlative in the contemporary episteme with an example given to us by Spivak when she proclaims that white men are saving brown women from brown men. This effort does not only infantilize people in different cultural paradigms, it also heightens and intensifies the neocolonial project of the West by laying claim over what should be recognized as oppression and how it should be addressed. What is more, these efforts serve the strategic end of displacing any cultural malaise that may be observed in the so-called first world onto the so-called underdeveloped other. So by presenting a situation that appears to be worse than what might be experienced in the developed countries, the jackals of white feminist activism whitewash the experiences of women and other gender and racial minorities from receiving the recognition that they need or that they want. These efforts to silence the other under the veneer of a benevolent humanitarian project are aligned with the malevolent streams of a Baudrillardian politics of antagonism. They, first and foremost, deny a voice to the other, or failing that, instill their own voice into the mouths of the other. Hence the frightening question Spivak poses, can the subaltern speak? Antagonism and therefore the delicate principle of seduction cannot be realized when the other is stripped of their autonomy and forced into a subject position alien to their history and culture. Globalization is one force that strives to purge the world of differing of difference, applying, in the case of women's oppression, a blanket assessment of all women's issues, as though it is a phenomenon experienced invariably, uh, or isn't experienced invariably, or is experienced invariably. Jeez, losing it. Baudrillard puts the problem of the universal poignantly when he writes that there is a major inconsistency in continuing to use a discourse of the universal as a discourse of reference when it has no meaning or effect anywhere because it is how discrimination becomes more ferocious. Sarah Ahmed, recognizing the oppressive propensity of any universal discourse, suggests that the task for feminists in the wake of this violent trend is to make visible the boundaries which constitute women's rights rather than assume their universality. This corresponds more broadly to the dictum Baudrillard puts forth in, it, in his imagining the possibility to challenge power. In his words, it is power itself that has to be abolished, not just in the refusal to be dominated, but equally and as violence in the refusal to dominate. The first step in this process is to acknowledge difference, singularity, and by virtue of that difference to recognize that a solution conducted in one epistemic framework may not necessarily apply to 
another. This is not to prescribe some relativist form of non-action, far from it. Instead, listening should be privileged over didactic prescription so that changes, if they are truly sought, uh, can be conducted. White feminists mobilizing the virtuous projects of humanitarian benevolence are perhaps the most explicit example of malevolent acceptance and denial. There is, however, a more ubiquitous institution performing the same function, and that is the logic of computation. Now, in his book, The Lo Cultural Logic of Computation, David Columbia puts forth the thesis that the logic of computation has crept into the cultural zeitgeist of the West and has concomitantly positioned itself as a natural or neutral logic. As such, it is often believed that rational calculation might account for every part of the material world. This thesis echoes the one put forward by Michel Foucault when he considered the genesis of rationalism in the 17th century, where resemblance must be subjected to proof by comparison. That is, it will not be accepted until its identity and the series of its differences have been discovered by means of measurement with a common unit or more radically by its position in an order. For something to be recognized only in its place within an order is to have that thing be determined by a general logic of abstraction that precedes it, removing the recognition of the thing from the thing itself. The general logic portends uh, the logic of computation that relies heavily on binarisms, hierarchy, and instrumental rationality that monopolize the process by which something can be recognized outside of the structural relations of power that rely fundamentally on this logic. Binaries without antagonisms are um, what I propose with the neologism diomoima, a simulacral binary that structurally resembles the classic binary, but evacuated of all radical potential. This is how the binary logics that permeate throughout society today are so easily accepted. They appropriate the familiar concept of antagonism that we've always had and presents a simulated version of them like gender binaries, for example, that serve to consolidate power by freezing the two poles that comprise any binary uh, and just freezing them there. And this is because, as argued earlier, in the context of the art auction, Baudrillard considers antagonism a necessary evil to promote change and development, whereas the binary is emblematic of the logic of computation arrest any such development. Upon theorizing the oppressive implications of the logic of computation, Columbia hones his gaze on one particular contentious issue, the ubiquity of the English language. For Columbia, few English-only speakers realize the implications of the fact that almost all programming languages consist entirely of English words and phrases. This observation contrasts heavily with the image often associated with contemporary technology, its emancipatory potential, uh, for example, uh, its propensity for cultural recognition, etc., that is championed for promising limitless possibility. Underneath the screen resides a highly complex yet homogeneous matrix of networks comprised of algorithms and data unseen to the average user. These algorithms are the root of the system, territorializing its supposedly limitlessness, supposed limitlessness by erecting binaries that it may not circumvent. Technology is then not nearly as deterritorialized as one might be want to think. Indeed, there are a high number of restrictions imposed atop the machinic limitations of the hardware and software themselves, but I will not discuss those here. Rather, the prevalence of a single language that subtends most, if not all, technological developments highlights the surreptitious conjuring of a lingua franca unbeknownst by many. Moreover, this totalizing homogenization serves to naturalize these technologies in a way that places them beyond reproach. Sophia Noble contributes to this discussion in her Algorithms of Oppression when she argues that there is an implicit assumption that algorithms are neutral technologies and therefore incapable of discrimination when, in fact, algorithms often emulate the ideological paradigm from which they derive. We might be able to then surmise that computers are as much an extension and, and the apotheosis of a logic of the simulacrum as they are the logic of computation. This is because both the simulacrum and the logic of computation perform a highly de devious trompe l'oeil in their exertion of their oppressive potential. They mask their true form from under the veil of an overtly unreal possibility, the computer screen, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, etc., that absorbs the critical gaze of those that engage with them this technological development operates in contradistinction to Baudrillard's promising outlook of the singularity of language, which is that even if language has a history and an origin, it seems to reproduce itself as is at every moment and autonomously to reinvent itself. 
The process of reinvention is integral to Baudrillard's conceptualization of a benevolent uh, noumenal, pr noumenal practice, one that sees a development of a thing in itself that is catalyzed by contact with other things in themselves outside of it. The totalizing logic of these technologies and their English supremacist under undertones do not then risk sequestering reality by the weight of the simulacrum. Rather, this image shows that it is the reverse that is the case, that these technologies, in their promoting a single worldview and appropriating the binary structure indicative of antagonism, are galvanizing a mapped and structured reality that is wholly objective, denying any possible any antithetical position. These two illustrations of malevolent acceptance and denial hold serious consequences in the context of today's political climate and pay heed to Baudrillard's fundamental concerns for the future. The Baudrillardian implications, the excess uh, of reality, the transmutation of the other into an extension of the majority, the exorcism of antagonism in favor of hierarchical binaries are exacerbated when we consider them in relation to contemporary strategies employed by many popular political and cultural figures today. These are the people who, in the face of the alienating effects of the steady homogenization and totalization of the globe and societal mobility, cling to various compensatory re-territorializations, as Deleuze and Guattari describe it. And one such example is Jordan Peterson in his most recent book, 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos, that, from the title alone, promises to ground that which has been supposedly uprooted in society today. Now, to stress this promise, Peterson flowers his discourse with a number of thinkers whom he claims adhere to this approach, Nietzsche, for instance, and while it would be impossible to know what Nietzsche might think of today's political and cultural climate, I've argued elsewhere that Peterson appears to resemble the ascetic priest that Nietzsche castigates. This is an idea that Nietzsche puts forth in On the Genealogy of Morality. This is an idea that Nietzsche puts forth in On the Genealogy of Morality when he outlines the reactionary tendency of people devoid of life to invest their lives with cruel and unpleasant activities, to internalize the illusion of progress and pecuniary decency. It is my contention that the same could be said of Peterson, who, like everyone else, is in the throes of a system steadily moving towards integral reality as Baudrillard describes it, and by virtue of this fact is desperately investing arbitrary acts, making one's bed, for instance, uh, with a transcendent meaning to ostensibly curve the, curb the alienating effects of the system on a collision course with the complete simulacrum. These responses are completely wrong, however. What is more, they are not simply a response to a contemporary phenomenon. The ancestors of these ideas extend much further back than the threat of integral reality itself. It should be noted then that this system is wholly new and has arrived on the scene faster than anyone could imagine. Reactionaries are thus forced to adopt the old tactics of territorialization that will only exacerbate the situation by stimulation of the malevolent binary structures I've located in Baudrillard's work, or that he identifies. This, of course, is not limited to the careful construction of a set of rules to follow. Any transcendent signification um, to a universal or unchanging truth serves the purpose of constructing an idea of reality that is unaffected by the simulacrum. Biological determinism, gender rules, sexual orientation, um, the permanence of scientific reason, and the absurd reliance on facts and logic in today's political climate are all contentious topics, taken up mostly in conserv by conservative pundits to justify the existence of truths that can, with enough an analytic rigor, be unearthed and disseminated to the rest of the world. Of course, this very project calls into question uh, the purported transcendent universe universality of these concepts. The secret of a Baudrillardian approach to uh, contemporary cultural criticism is to begin from the axiom of truth, that truth, or reality, if it ever existed, was determined as such, not by its permanence. It was determined by its fluidity, a fluidity made possible by the antagonistic principle of seduction, holding neither side in higher regard than the other. This is what is properly understood as conflictual reality, that which is never resolved, that which always posits its own disappearance in an endless onslaught of difference and antagonism and agonism. So that's it. Um, I hope you enjoyed it uh, and it was informative. I'd love to hear any comments you might have, anything you think I got wrong or I should have um, included. I would have really, uh, yeah, it's quite, quite a few years ago, or well, quite a few, three, three or four years ago I wrote this, uh, so my thinking has developed quite a bit since then, um, but in any case, it's a 
something to criticize. So if you have any criticisms, I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe. Uh, yeah. Catch you next time. Take care.